Mm, and this, this work was uh, done in collaboration with uh, another lab in Grenoble, so Institut Nel, in the team of uh, Stevania Pizzini and Laurent Rano, and uh, a collaboration as well with the LSPM in Viltaneuse and the team of Mohamed Belmegenei. So uh, after reminding what are skirmions, what I mean by chirality, and what is this zaloshinsky maria interaction, I will present you our samples, how we measure, and how we measured uh, the how we changed uh, the chirality of those uh, spin textures. Uh, so first, what is a magnetic skirmion? Uh, so magnetic skirmion is in fact um, a specific spin texture. So it's a magnetic domain which has usually a circular shape. So it's, uh, the size is between micrometers and it can go down to nanometers. And the specificity of skirmion is that the domain wall, which is the region in white here surrounding, so in between the inside and the outside domains, the domain wall is chiral. So I will come back on this uh, just, just after. So those uh, skirmions were first uh, predicted in the 90s by Bogdanov, uh, Ivanov, and co-workers. And they were first experimentally observed in bulks, uh, 2009 here. And later on, uh, in ultrasin films uh, that has perpendicular magnetic anisotropy, so several years later. So in this presentation, I will focus on uh, these ultrasin films with perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. And in this case, the skirmions are, are of nail type. So let me uh, do some reminders on the type of skirmions and the chirality. So in uh, thin films uh, with perpendicular magnetic anisotropy, so here I've represented side views. So uh, there are some domains, so up domain, down domain, and here in between, there is a domain wall. So the usual uh, case uh, is to have a rotation axis um, in the domain wall, which is perpendicular to the domain wall. And in that case, it's called a block domain wall. So it can rotate in one or the other direction. Uh, and the energy of the domain wall per unit surface is usually explained, uh, written like that. So four square root of the exchange stiffness times the effective anisotropy. Okay. Uh, you can also have uh, nail walls. Uh, in that case, the rotation axis is perpendicular, is within uh, the domain wall. Uh, and as the same as for a uh, block case, you have two sense of rotations. So in the case of nail walls, uh, you see that you have volume charges. So usually in thin films with perpendicular magnetic anisotropy, those walls are not favored and you have mainly block walls. Uh, so when I discuss of domain wall type, I will discuss between block and nail type. And chirality, in fact, corresponds to the sense of rotation if it's clockwise or counterclockwise. And this is what I mean by chirality. Okay, so in, in our films, uh, the, our films are ferromagnets. So we have the usual Heisenberg exchange that favors parallel spins. And in some cases, when you have a breaking of inversion symmetry and you have some spin orbit coupling, uh, it may occur an interaction that is called zaloshinsky moria interaction. That's because of the name of the people who uh, explained it and uh, pre predicted. It, um, and it's written like that. So it's an anti-symmetric exchange interaction that favors a perpendicular spin configuration. So if we come back uh, to our four uh, type of domains, so two types and two chirality for, for each, uh, in the case of thin films with perpendicular magnetic anisotropy for symmetry reasons, this DIJ vector here, the DMI vector, is usually uh, pointing inside the screen or outside the screen. So it's favoring nail domain walls with respect to block domain walls because it's decreasing their energy due to this uh, DMI coefficient here. Okay. And if you have, uh, so now we have no, only two chiralities that are possible. And it depends on the sign uh, the orientation of this D vector. So in one case, it will favor the blue uh, chirality, which is, I will call counterclockwise because it's rotating counterclockwise when you go from left to right. And if the DMI vector is inverted, you will favor the other chirality. Okay. So if you uh, take a skirmion and um, you, uh, you take a, a bubble, a domain, 
and you cross it radially. So you have uh, outside, you have up spins, inside you have down spins, and the domain wall can either along the, this direction rotate in the same sense, meaning the same chirality, or rotate in one sense and then in the other direct in the other sense. And so it means they have different chiralities. So if you apply a magnetic field to uh, annihilate those domains, in the case where you have two different cavalities, in fact, it will continuously switch. So the two domains will go close to each other and the, uh, the spin, which is in the middle, will continuously rotate towards the field direction. This is easy to switch. There's no energy barrier to overcome. In the case where you have the same chirality, in fact, the two domains will go close to each other. And in the end, there will remain only one spin down. And if you want to uh, switch this spin, uh, it's not possible to do it in the continuous approximation. You have a discontinuity. So of course, uh, the spins are not in, in reality continuous. So you can do it physically, but it's um, uh, creating physically an energy barrier to destroy this uh, skirmion. So that's what is represented here. So here you have the saturated state. Here you have the skirmion state. And in order to go from one state to the other, you have an energy barrier that has to be overcome. And this is kind of a topological protection. Uh, it's because of this specific uh, um, uh, only one chirality of the, of the domains. And this gives this energy barrier. Okay. So in the case where you have DMI in your sample, only uh, skirmions or skirmion type uh, domains can be uh, created in your sample. Okay, um, so why uh, skirmions have been a lot of studies in the late um, years? Um, first, they are small. They can be, as I said, from micron scale to nanometer scale. So they are interesting for spintronics. Uh, they can be stabilized at room temperature, as was shown uh, at SpinTech by Olivier Bull and co-workers. Um, and, and it also can be uh, tuned by a gate voltage. So for instance, switched on and off. So here you have many, many skirmions. Here you have no skirmions underneath the electrode uh, when you change the voltage. So this, we, we observed that few few years ago. Uh, and a very important uh, property of skirmions is that when you inject a current in the stack, you can push, push them. So you move them uniformly uh, with the current like is represented on this uh, micromagnetic simulation, and that, that makes those skirmions very interesting for spintronic applications. Uh, so that's why they have been proposed um, to be used as data bits for memories or for magnetic logic. Uh, more recently, there have been also uh, um, propositions to use these skirmions, these quasi-particles that can be uh, controlled and manipulated quite easily. They have been proposed in less conventional computing, so probabilistic computing. Um, uh, low power computing uh, with Brownian motion. And they are also being proposed to be used in artificial synapses, so for neuromorphic um, computing. So if you're interested in Skirmion, you can, for instance, go and see this, uh, this review. Okay, so now I will uh, present a bit more our system. So we will, uh, I will discuss about uh, this kind of stack. So a ferromagnet that is sandwiched between a heavy metal and an oxide. Um, in this stack, the, the interfaces here between the ferromagnet and the heavy metal and with the metal oxide as well, provides perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. So the magnetization wants to be perpendicular to the plane. There is no uh, inversion symmetry. And in, in addition to the spin orbit coupling, and this will create this uh, DMI that I remind here the, the expression. Okay. Uh, so this D DMI coefficient can be decomposed here with here. D is the DMI coefficient, which will give the strength of this DMI interaction. So these DMI in our samples come from the two interfaces. So it's an interfacial uh, origin. Uh, so we have mainly two mechanisms. So uh, so-called Levy, uh, Fert Levy mechanism at the interface between the heavy metal and the ferromagnet, and uh, Rajba mechanism at the interface between the ferromagnet and the oxide. So here we see that 
at the interface between those materials, there is an intrinsic electric field. And this electric field in the reference frame of the electron will be felt by the electron as a magnetic field, so Rajba field, which will um, make this cycloidal uh, rotation of the spin. And this is uh, the DMI uh, that's creating these counted spins. Okay, and this is an interfacial mechanism due to the presence of this electric field. Okay, so that, let's discuss a bit more about this D coefficient here. So if we um, represent, so if we take a, a negative D coefficient, so those spins that are initially parallel due to Heisenberg exchange, due to this DMI, they will start to rotate clockwise. So in presence of this negative DMI, we will obtain clockwise skirmians. In the presence of a positive uh, DMI, the contrary occurs. So the strength and the sign of this DMI coefficient will define the chirality of the skirmion and also its properties, for instance, its size, because it's um, important in the domain wall energy. Okay, so I, I told you before that they're interesting, the skirmions, because we can move them by a current. So if we inject a current in this stack, uh, in the heavy metal here, there is a spin all effect. So it charge current charge are injected horizontally, and due to spinal effect, we will inject spins in the ferromagnet. So because of this effect at the interface between the heavy metal and the ferromagnet, and depending on the chirality of the skirmion, it will create a force. So due to spin orbit torques, due to this spinal effect, and the force will be in opposite directions depending on the chirality of the skirmion. So skirmions will tend to move parallel to the current in the clockwise case and anti-parallel to the current in the counterclockwise case. Uh, so this current induced motion will be a, a probe for chirality. Okay, so our sample and our, our setup. So we used uh, samples which are uh, tantalum, the heavy metal, a ferromagnet, iron cobalt boron, and an oxide. So we deposited by a magneton sputtering. And what we do to finally tune the magnetic properties is that we used wedges, so gradients. So along the x direction, we have a gradient of the ferromagnet. And along the y direction, we have a gradient of the tantalum that we further oxidize with a certain amount of oxygen. So along this wedge, we have more or less oxidation. So we can measure uh, the magnetic hysteresis loop uh, at every location on our samples using magneto-optical care effect, so which gives the perpendicular magnetic uh, component of magnetization. And we see that we have a central region where magnetization is perpendicular because of this surface anisotropy term, which is positive and favors perpendicular anisotropy. When it's too thin, it's paramagnetic, it's only dead layers. And when it's too thick, it's coming in plane because we have the usual dipolar volume uh, anisotropy that uh, prefers magnetization to be in the plane. Um, so how do we measure that, them? Uh, so how do we characterize more those skirmions? So we use this magneto-optical care effect microscope in polar configuration, so PMOC. Um, this is an example of image. So here we have when we want to apply a gate voltage later, we deposit a transparent electrode here in blue, and we can see through the electrode or uh, outside of the electrode. And we have here some skirmions that are typically one or two microns in size. Uh, in order to apply a gate or to make uh, to inject currents, we use tips or wires. And uh, we find skirmions at specific locations on our sample. So if we take back our, our map of um, anisotropy, um, we see that on this line between the transition between perpendicular region and in-plane region, we observe skirmion every time. So this is because uh, in these regions, the anisotropy is very small. And so the cost of domain wall is not large. And then we can create dom uh, domain walls and the skirmions. Okay, so now let's discuss about the chirality of those skirmions and how we control it in, uh, in our sample. So first by material. So how do we characterize it? So we measured uh, directly the DMI by using a specific techniques, which is brilliant light scattering. So these measurements were done by uh, Mohamed Belmegenei and, and his team at uh, LSPM. 
So it's a measurement where you inject a green light on a, on a sample where magnetization is in the plane. And you will have an interaction of the phonons with magnon spin wave. And you will have creation and annihilation of those magnons, which uh, propagates in the plane. And they have a certain chirality. So their energy, if we have DMI, their energy will be different. And these stoke and anti-stoke mechanism will occur at different frequencies. And the, quant the difference in the frequency here will quantify, will allow to quantify uh, this DMI coefficient here. So here I note that the, the experimental DMI coefficient is the opposite uh, with respect to the one that I defined before. So there are those two conventions in the literature. So we have to be careful with the sign of the coefficient. Okay, so on our sample, uh, we measured uh, DMI at different locations. So depending on the oxidation here, so close to the region where we have skirmions, and we see that depending on the oxidation, we have either positive or negative DMI. So DMI changes sign with oxidation of the top interface. So we um, further measured motion of skirmions in, um, in those different locations. Uh, so I hope you will see the video through Zoom with this enough uh, resolution. Uh, if not, you will see here, this is the current we inject, and this is the motion of the small black dots that move to the right on the top, to the left on the bottom. Okay, so we see that depending on the region, we have different DMI sign, and the skirmion move in opposite directions with the same current. So this means that we have an opposite chirality of skirmions depending on the oxidation. Um, so now, we can try to apply a gate voltage uh, to, to play on this chirality because interfacial magnetism can be tuned by a gate voltage. So let me remind that um, our structure, we can tune a DMI by different methods, whether by changing the heavy metal, by tuning the ferromagnetic thickness, or as I just explained to you, by tuning the oxidation state. So what we previously observed uh, several years ago is that due to the fact that DMI has an origin, interfacial origin, when we apply a gate voltage, we can tune its amplitude. But at the time, we were not able to tune its sign because the voltage to apply were too high. Um, in the literature, it's known for years that we can push and um, pull oxygen ions in some materials by applying a gate voltage. So it seems that gate voltage would be a very good tool to uh, tune this DMI and thus skirmion chirality. So let's um, apply the gate voltage. So I remind the structure. So tantalum, iron cobalt boron, tantalum, which is more or less oxidized. And we, uh, we are at positions where the skirmion chirality is either clockwise or counterclockwise. Uh, and what we do, so here we see on this, on this graph, the skirmions move parallel to the current, so they are clockwise. Uh, we are in this region where they are initially clockwise. Then we apply a positive gate voltage, and we see now that they move in the opposite direction. So they have been switched to counterclockwise. And this is consistent with a removal of the oxygen from the interface, so as if we go from the star location, from the star location here to the triangle location. Okay, so we can do a similar thing. So this was done with a small magnetic field to, to stabilize those skirmions, but we can do the same with zero magnetic field. So in that case, it's no more skirmion, but it's stripes, so domain wall, but they are chiral due to the presence of this DMI. So we start from the same location as before. Here we see that domain walls move along the current. We apply a positive voltage. So the electrode is here in, in uh, the whiter, in the lighter color. Domain walls move uh, anti-parallel to the current, so they have changed chirality. But now what we can do is to start from a region where they are already counterclockwise, inject a current, and they move in this direction. And then if we inject the opposite polarity of the voltage, so here it's not very visible because they change size, size, sorry, but if we apply a small 
magnetic field to make them a bit less dense to see them, we see that they are now counterclockwise. Uh, so by applying a positive voltage, we can go from clockwise to counterclockwise, and a negative gate voltage, we can go from counterclockwise to clockwise. Uh, then we studied, uh, so this is again consistent with the migration of oxygen. Uh, another typical, um, a typical um, um, thing about uh, ionic migration is that it's quite slow and it can be persistent. So we wanted to test for the persistence of the effect to, to ensure that the mechanism is ionic migration. So we start from a clockwise domains, so they move along the current. We apply a pulse or a pulse of positive voltage, and then we measure under zero magnetic, zero electric field. Now it's inverted. So we have moved, we have inverted the chirality, but it's remaining inverted. Then again, we switch chirality with a negative voltage. Uh, we go back to clockwise, so it's reversible. And we can again switch back to counterclockwise, it's reproducible. And if we remain at zero volt for a few hours, we see that it's going back to the initial chirality. And this can be explained by the fact that naturally the system wants to oxidize more because the metals wants to oxidize. So it's thermody thermodynamically more stable to come back to this initial state, which is more oxidized. So again, those uh, indicate that it's consistent with ionic migration. Okay, so let me uh, now finish on our micromagnetic simulations uh, where we try to understand this mechanism. So we, um, and to, to see what happens if the skirmance is smaller. So we mm, used MUMAX. Uh, this is a skirmance which is stabilized for a negative uh, DMI. So it's clockwise. So it means that the arrows on the domain wall are going outside here in the domain wall and here for positive DMI is going inside the spins in the domain wall, and this is counterclockwise. Um, so in the case where we have no DMI, uh, we have a skirmion. So if we zoom a bit, we see that the, the domain wall is block type and the size is smaller. This is because of the cost of a domain wall where you have no more DMI, it's costing more energy, so it's smaller. Okay, so if we, Start from this initial skirmion, we, um, we uh, make as if we apply a gate voltage in this simulation and we tune DMI. And we see that we manage to switch chirality of the skirmion continuously without losing the skirmion, without destabilizing it. But it's changing its size. And so it's a chirality reversal, which is possible without skirmion annihilation. Okay. Uh, finally, what can be done with this uh, skirmion? So, if we inject a current here on this skirmion, which is clockwise, whoops, what happens is that we have a motion of, of, the, of the skirmion, which is not completely parallel to the current, which is a bit tilted. So, this is called skirmional angle. I will not enter into the details, but by tuning uh, the DMI, we see that we can tune the angle of the propagation. So tune the trajectory of the skirmion, which opens perspectives towards individual manipulation of skirmions to make them move in a very desired direction in a device. Uh, okay, and this, all, this angle is not so much appreciated in, for application because it can go on the side of the tracks and it's not uh, very, it can uh, annihilate the skirmion. So usually we try to avoid it. Okay, so let me now uh, conclude and uh, give you some perspectives of our work. So I discussed about uh, the control of chirality either by oxidation in materials or by changing the oxidation via the gate voltage application. So very low power uh, method. Uh, so this tuning of um, chirality with the gate voltage is persistent, reversible, and reproducible. Uh, in terms of perspective, so it's uh, nice, it would be nice to, to have a faster effect because here it's ionic migration, so it's taking a bit of time, so it's 90 seconds because it's before it's changing chirality, so charge effects due only to the change of the density of electrons at the interface would make faster effects. 
And in terms of applications, it would be interesting to go towards a more controlled motion of stermions in some devices for spintronics, for instance. Uh, so with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and of course to thank uh, the fundings that allowed uh, this work. Thank you very much. I'm open for question if you if you have some. Uh, thank you, Ellen, uh, for this very uh, interesting talk. Uh, uh, so any questions in the audience? Or... I'm not sure you managed to see the videos. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the connection was good enough. That's good. Yes. By Zoom, sometimes it's. Uh... <laughs> There's a question from uh, Milan. Yes, yeah, um, I maybe I miss it, but what sets the speed of of uh, of drag of this uh, or of movement of these skirmions? What's what's the physical uh, limit the to, to that? Yes. Um, so if you have a lot of defects in the sample, so if the sample is not homogeneous, it will um, be a problem. Of course, you can increase the current density to make them move faster, uh, and then it's mainly their size. If they are bigger, you have more. Uh, the, in fact, the spin orbit talks uh, pl um, uh, play on the regions that are in the domain wall. So if the domain wall is bigger, then it will move. Um, if it move faster, because you have more spins that are um, where on which you push, roughly. So they will go faster. But if you are in the track and the skirmions want to go on the edge because of this angle then it's not good because you lose the transverse component. So all the material parameter will result in the size of the skirmion and then in the, in the speed. Of course, you have also uh, the efficiency of the spin orbit torque. So it depends on the spinal uh, effect that you have from the bottom material, from the heavy metal, of the transmission of the spins in the, in the film magnet as well. So the efficiency of the spin orbit talks. Uh, I have a question about, uh, I'm not from the domain at all, so I'm very curious to learn more. Um, I, what I didn't really get is how you control the nucleation of the skirmions. So uh, it seems to be a completely random statistical process or, I mean, so how do you know how many will be generated and yeah, so here I presented you the energy diagram of uh, the schemions we use, the typical energy diagram. So where is it? Up, um, here. So we have an energy barrier, which is, in our case, uh, roughly uh, 23 kBT. So it means that when we decrease, uh, when we are in the good conditions for schemions to be possibly stable, uh, we wait a bit of time and usually they nucleate statistically. So it's thermally activated. Okay. Uh, and that's why in fact, in our sample, the regions where we stabilize them is very, very narrow because it's exactly in the region where um, they can be nucleated with a specific time. If we change a bit the parameters, this energy barrier will change a bit. And as it's exponential, we will lose them or it will be too, too difficult to create them. Uh, we can tune these uh, parameters, uh, these energy barriers, by adapting a bit the magnetic anisotropy, the DMI, and this is what we have done. Um, whoops, where is it? Here, when we nucleated or annihilated um, the the skirmions with a gate voltage, so here we change these energy barriers, so we can tune it. Um, with the gate voltage, it's changing the anisotropy at the interface and it's changing these energy barriers. Also, it's possible to inject a current and this uh, locally uh, creates a, a skirmion. These are but some other methods. Would, would it be imaginable to um, uh, perfectly control, I mean, maybe this is complete science fiction, uh, but to perfectly control the creation of a single skirmion, or is that yeah, simply so not possible? In fact, here, you see my pointer. So here, this is a measurement. Oops, 
here that was made in uh, so the white dash here is a pillar and so in this pillar it was created so it's here this is the location of the scanner that is measured by xmcd pim by uh, synchrotron methods so in this sample um, because of the lateral constraints, it's creating one skirmion every time you go at this magnetic field, at the proper yeah. magnetic field. So it's uh, because of some lateral constraints. The same if you do some tracks, the skirmions will create. And if you do, for instance, a cross, you know that it will be more easy to create a skirmion in the, in the middle and it's working uh, quite well. You control where you put the skirmion. And that's now we are working on, on tracks and not on full film to locate more and to control more one skirmion uh, to nucleate and to change its chirality, change its direction of propagation. Okay. Okay. And there's another question. Hi, thanks, Hélène. Um, I had a question about this simulation where you can switch the chirality by tuning the, the voltage. Yeah. Do you think we could? Uh, make an experiment where we, where we would see it, for example, with NVs. Uh, if we have the um, uh, if we have the quantitative map, we could actually measure the chirality and see the switch uh, directly. Yeah. I think yeah. that would be possible. Um, so I see two problems. Uh, so in our samples uh, where we show the chirality switch, in fact, uh, we were at DMI values that were very close to zero because then it's easier to, to go from positive to negative if you're not far from zero. So the value, absolute value of DMI is very small. So in fact, in our sample, the, the spins are not completely nail probably. Uh, so I'm not sure it would be possible to measure with NV. Second problem uh, is that uh, we are to be, you have to be sure that during this uh, chirality inversion, um, so if it's with a gate, uh, we have to be sure that the skirmion remains stable. So here we see that already with these parameters, skirmion with zero DMI is stable. So it's an intermediate state, it's stable, but you see it's very small. So it's not so far to be annihilated. So we have to adjust finally the parameters to be sure that it will remain stable during the switching. Of course, if you want to go only a, a measurement with DMI positive, DMI negative, and DMI zero on a single sample, maybe it's possible to measure, but the LECT is very, very small. So that could be tried, but I'm not sure it's easy to see the difference. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I had a couple of questions, but I think we have to move on. Yeah, or oh, it can be in the, in the chat if you need. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank okay, you. Thanks. Uh, let's thank again, uh, Hélène, for the presentation.